The best drivers in Formula 1 are widely debated upon, and to attempt to put them in any sort of order is basically asking for a wall of comments explaining how and why you're completely and utterly incorrect. What is easier to look at is the strongest Formula 1 grids of all time. The grid being the drivers who took part in a given season. For how this is going to work, I will be taking into account essentially the strength of the given grid, including the achievements after the given year. So for example, if I took 1951 and someone won the championship in 1952, we would count that as an achievement. The first grid I would really say is 1967, and all those grids around the late 60s were full of insanely quick talent. This season, however, is a season in which seven of the competing drivers were, or would go on to be, Formula One World Champions. The title battle was between the two Brabham drivers of Denny Hume and then three-time world champion Jack Brabham himself. The prior Hume or Holm ending up with the prestigious title. Also with the potential to fight for the title this season was the legendary Jim Clark, but the Lotus he was driving was about as reliable as Lance Stroll making it to Q3. Clark DNF'd in 5 of the 11 races in the season. In the other Lotus was 1962 world champion and soon to be 1968 world champion Graham Hill, who seemed to struggle even more in the Lotus that season, finishing only 3 races. John Surtees, the 1964 world champion, was at the helm of a Honda to mount his challenge, and saw a win at the Italian Grand Prix. Jackie Stewart was in a BRM, which only managed to finish two races, both, however, on the podium, and 1970 world champion Jochen Rint was stuck in a bit of a slower Cooper car, so across the grid, there was some real talent. In terms of non-world championship winning drivers, Chris Amon, Pedro Rodriguez, Dan Gurney, Bruce McLaren, and Jackie Ix also took up slots on the grid, all talented drivers who were quick in their own right. So, it was was very competitive, with the perfect balance of older and proven drivers who brought in experience, drivers in the prime of their career ready to give it everything, and young talents looking to prove themselves early on in their career. The title fight itself wasn't the closest we'd ever seen. Benny Holm was brought into the Brabham team in order to be the second driver, but because of reliability issues for main driver Jack Brabham, Holm ended up leading the championship and took it reasonably comfortably. But these sort of F1 grids only come around every few years. But this time in the late 60s was, in my opinion, one of the first times F1 had been around long enough to actually have some well-established greats. But as we head further into the future, we'll see there's more talent to be explored. Although I think the 1975 grid is worth an honourable mention, the actual next grid I would like to look in depth into would be the 1985 Formula 1 grid, which saw six would-be and world champions fighting it out amongst themselves. Alain Prost would take the title with McLaren that year. His first world championship with the main contender being the Ferrari of Michael Alboreto, who was actually leading until round 11 in Zandvoort, but at the end of the season fell away from the title by suffering five mechanical DNFs in a row in the final five rounds. I mean, if you suffered five DNFs in modern F1, you'd have a hard time finishing ahead of a Haas in the championship, never mind achieving second place. But unfortunately for Alboreto, this would be his best ever season and one that really leaves you wondering what could have been. At least we know over the last 40 years, Ferrari's reliability hasn't gotten any better. Ellen's Prost teammate for the season would be reigning world champion Nicky Lauda, who also suffered from bad luck, being able to only finish three of the 14 races he entered. A bit of a shock considering just last season, he was the world champion. Thankfully for Nicky, one of those finishes was a win in Zandvoort, but also mixed in the field was a young Ayrton Senna. At that point, driving his first season in Lotus. He achieved two wins this year, one in Portugal and one in Belgium, showing the beginnings of some extraordinary talent. Keke Rosberg and Nigel Mansell were the two drivers helping Williams score some points. Both drivers scored two wins in the season, Rosberg in Detroit and Australia, Mansell at Brands Hatch and in South Africa. But as was common with Mansell, his consistency lacked, and Rosberg would comfortably outscore him over the full season, something that would come to a head when Mansell fought the next driver, Nelson Piquet, who at the time in 1985 was a two-time world champion, took a seat at Brabham, being able to secure one win at the Grand Prix in France, but nothing much else. As always with the 80s, all of these drivers suffered their fair share of engines going boom. There is one criticism of the season, however, and that's that maybe the mix of drivers was a little unbalanced. Reigning champ Nicky Lauda, for example, was almost certainly past his prime, and although it was still quick,
Sick was never really a match even the year before for Pros Speed. Senna was also still early on in his career, and the Lotus just wouldn't be reliable enough to ever bring him into the fight, despite his third place finish in the championship. Williams at this point was still yet to hit an era of domination, leaving Rosberg and Mansell again further afoot from the title fight. And champion PK would have to leave the Brabham team before he would see another world title. So if we move on a few years, we actually see again a more competitive grid in 1993. 1993 was a season of greats. Although the grid only had five champions compared to the six and seven we looked at before, which were Prost, Senna, Schumacher, Hill and Hakkinen, the standard of driver was impressive. Prost and Senna were up at the front fighting, McLaren versus Williams, something we'd see at the start of 2023 with the two teams scrapping over 17th as opposed to first. Schumacher was able to be a consistent contender for the podium and secured a win in Portugal, with Damon Hill also taking wins too in Italy, Belgium and Hungary. But along the grid, there were solid drivers who were filled to the brim with talent. Patrese, Alessi, Brundle, Berger, Herbert, Barrichello and Irvine, to just name a few. But here's the thing, in 1993, although Senna was in with a chance, Ross just took the title a little too convincingly. And that leaves only one grid of drivers unanimously looked upon as the gold standard. And that is the 2012 Formula One grid. This has essentially become immortalized in F1 culture. Like in 1967, there were seven drivers who were or would become world champion. I'll run you through the names. Vettel, Alonso, Hamilton, Raikkonen, Rosberg, Button, and Schumacher himself all took part in this season. To expand upon that as well, again like discussed in 1967, we had drivers who were older and wiser, like Schumacher and Raikkonen. We had some drivers in their absolute prime, like Button, Hamilton, Alonso, and Vettel, along with champ to be like Rosberg, who was still proving himself at Mercedes. Alongside the world champs, however, you had some extremely well-decorated drivers also taking up seats on the grid. Mark Webber, Felipe Massa, who at this point in time is still not a world champion, try as he might, Roman Grosjean, Sergio Perez, and Nico Hulkenberg, to name but a few. Even further down the grid, there was drivers like a young Daniel Ricciardo. But the one thing that makes this season stand out even more than the others I mentioned was how close it was. Seven race winners in seven races. One of those even being Lord Maldonado. Still somehow Williams' last race win. And the title fight between Vettel and Alonso went down to just three points in favor of Vettel. In a season full of controversy, surprises, good and bad luck for the drivers involved. Over the full season, eight different drivers would end up winning races as Kimi Raikkonen took a surprise victory in Abu Dhabi, with him returning to the Lotus team that year. So you can see how 2012 was such a competitive year too. Unlike 67, where Horn took it a bit more convincingly, and 85 and 93, where Prost again had a bit more of a cushion to the drivers behind him. But how does the current F1 grid hold up in comparison? Well, looking at these other examples, you need a mixture of old and young. You need some drivers in their primes and some just starting off their careers. At the end of the day, sometimes you don't know how strong an F1 grid is until hindsight can tell you otherwise. The potential, therefore, is there, as there's also a strong myriad of race winners in the mix too. But only time will tell us where we end up ranking 2024. It's likely nothing will ever compare to the legend that was 2012 ever again, but it doesn't mean we should give up hope. Subscribe if you did enjoy, as we're going to try and see if we can get 100,000 subscribers by the end of the year. Goodbye!